Welcome to New Point Online. My name is Andy, one of the leaders here at the Dover campus. We're so glad you're joining us here today. If you're a parent of younger children, you're gonna wanna know what's happening this coming Sunday, December 17th. We're having a Christmas celebration and we're calling it Jammy Jam. Now what that means is your child gets to wear their PJs to church on Sunday, December 17th. How cool is that? This is one of the best times here at New Point. Crafts, games, Christmas music, and so much more. And your child can invite a friend as well, and it's a great time. Don't forget about our Christmas Eve services. They'll be happening at 9 a.m., 11 a.m., and 1 p.m. If you're a regular viewer of our online service, I wanna encourage you to hit the like and subscribe button to our YouTube channel. Our mission here at New Point is to inspire people to follow Jesus, and our YouTube channel is a big part of that. Well, we're ready to have a great service. Let's get started. Let's make some noise in the house of the Lord tonight. Hey, let's lift it up. Hey, hey. we worship, we worship, we worship the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. Come on now, let's make some noise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out to praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Give him a shout of praise. We sing. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Come on now. Because he hung up on that cross. And he rose up from that grave My God still rolling stones away Every boy There's joy in the house of the Lord There's joy in the house of the Lord today And we won't be quiet If we shout out to praise There's joy in the house of the Lord Our God is surely in His place And we won't be quiet we shout out to pray. Oh, do you guys believe that truth in this place tonight? Hey. We were the beggar, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. So let the house of the Lord sing praise. Lift that truth up. We were the beggar. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoner. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. So let the house of the Lord sing praise. This joy, this joy. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out to pray. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. Hey, we shout out to pray. This joy, this peace, this love. Shout out to praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in His place, and we won't be quiet. 
Christmas Eve, 1914. British troops were just catching their breath after another day of fighting in World War I. After four months of fighting, a million soldiers already killed. As the British troops were resting on that Christmas Eve, they couldn't believe what their eyes were seeing. They noticed these lights that started coming up out of the German trenches. And as they looked closer, they noticed that these lights were on Christmas trees. Next, they couldn't believe what their ears were hearing. Not only did they, were they, did they see the Christmas trees coming out, they, they noticed the Germans began to sing. And although they didn't recognize the song at first because it was in a different language, they, certain, they soon realized what it was. The Germans were singing Silent Night, Holy Night. All is right, right? All is calm. The Germans finished singing Silent Night, and when they finished, there was a little pause, and, and slowly but surely, out of the British trenches this time, they began to sing a song of their own. Oh, come, let us adore him. Where just hours before, the two sides were exchanging gunfire, they're now <laughs> exchanging Christmas hymns. After the song finished, the, the two sides, they met in the middle of the field and uh, they, they were shaking hands, they were greeting one another. And uh, because the next day was Christmas, they made a truce, albeit just for one day, to not fire a single shot on Christmas day. Even in the worst of circumstances, in the most chaotic of situations, even there, Jesus found a way to show up and to make his peace and his desire to bring peace to the world known. All of us in our own lives, we have all kinds of chaos that we face. Different levels, different seasons. And in the midst of that chaos, no matter how great it might be, what we celebrate at Christmas is the fact that we have a God who came to bring peace in the midst of us, who came to bring order out of the disorder of this world. And it's with that that we read in Isaiah chapter nine, which was written over 700 years before Jesus came, about why Jesus would come. This is what Isaiah wrote. He says, for to us, for to us who are facing all kinds of chaos, all kinds of disorder and brokenness in our lives, for to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Last week, if you weren't with us, we kicked off a series based off this very verse. What we celebrate at Christmas is not simply a baby being born in a, in a manger. What we celebrate is a God who came to our world to fix everything that is broken and disordered and to make it right again. We have a God who came to create order and peace out of the chaos that we experience day in and day out. You know, so much of the time in our life and in our, in, in our faith, we focus on, on the fact that God is a very personal God that it's a God who wants to know us. It's a God who can relate to us and wants to walk with us in life. In fact, three of these four names, three of these four qualities of who God is and how he relates to us speak to that personal nature. He's a wonderful counselor who guides us, 
when we don't know where to go or when we don't know what to do. He's an everlasting father who always provides for us in our time of greatest need. And he is a prince of peace who brings peace when, we, when, 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 when things in life are not okay. And when things don't make sense, he still gives that. Those speak to the personal nature of God. But one of the things that maybe we don't spend enough time in our church talking about is more of the transcendent attributes of God. The fact that we have a God who not only loves us, who not only cares for us, but a God who is all powerful, a God who is mighty. Because what our world really needs is not just someone who can help us get through the difficult. We need someone who's strong enough, who's powerful enough to fix what is broken. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk about the fact that Jesus is a mighty God and he is the exact mighty God that we need in our lives. And why that's so important is because all of us, what we desire is we want a world that's free of chaos. We don't wanna have to deal with all of the junk that we have to deal with that are so frustrating and the heartbreak that we deal with on a, on a regular basis. In short, we really want this life to be heaven right now and all of what heaven promises to be in the life after this life. But what we really need in this lifetime is we need a mighty God who can redeem the chaos, who can bring order out of the chaos. Because here, here's the big idea for today. Here's how I would sum it up, is that as we face chaos around us, we'll always sink in that chaos when we lose sight of the fact that God is mighty, when we lose sight of God's might. We learn about God's might in the very beginning. In Genesis chapter one, verses one through three, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Now that word formless and empty, what that actually means is that the, wor the world was in disorder or the world was in chaos. The universe was in complete chaos. And in the midst of the chaos, God created order. He brought, he brought order. That's what a mighty God does. He brings order out of chaos. In 1 Corinthians, it says this, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. It says, for God is not a God of disorder, but a God of peace. God desires to bring peace in the midst of the disorder that we face. So we have a choice. Because we're always gonna, in this lifetime at least, we're always gonna face the brokenness of this world. It's gonna challenge us in a lot of ways. And I don't have to tell you that. You know that. You experience that. You live that every day. But we do have a choice of what we can do with that chaos. Is, is we can either despair in the chaos. We can let it get the best of us. We can let that chaos discourage us. We can let that, dis, that uh, 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 chaos create fear within us. I don't know if you're the kind of person who's always thinking about what's the worst that can happen. If you're, if you're thinking like that, then fear probably rules your life way more than uh, you'd probably like to admit. We can allow, allow it to, to, to get us in a hurry, to lose sight of what's most important. Like We can despair in the chaos or we can rest in God's might. And that's what I wanna spend my time uh, talking about today is, is how we can do that. How do we rest in the fact that we do have a God who's mighty? And how does knowing that we have a mighty God help us be at rest and help us be at peace? And to be honest, there's three things I'm gonna talk about today. They all come out of Isaiah 40. We're gonna spend a little bit of time in that chapter. Um, these things are so elementary. They're so simple. I'm almost, as I was preparing for this message, I was almost like, man, this is so simple that it almost doesn't feel worthy enough to be talked about. But sometimes the simplest things are the most profound things when we actually let them take root in our minds and in our hearts. And here's the things that we learn about God's might. Here's, here's what will help us rest in the fact that we do have a mighty God who can ultimately fix what's broken and who can bring order out of the chaos. It's just simply, it's simply these things. God is bigger, we're pretty small, but yet although we're small, we're not unseen. And the third thing we're gonna talk about today is God's power has no limits. His might has no limits. So the first thing, first thing, let's talk about how do we rest in God's might. First for me is, 
is, uh, is, is just realizing that God's bigger. He's bigger than anything that we face. When's the last time that you spent a little bit of time just looking up at the stars? I've done a little bit of that again recently. And uh, man, every time I, I look at the stars, sometimes I, I feel the same way when you're at the ocean and you're just looking out at the vastness of the ocean. There's something about the vastness of the ocean or the vastness of space that is calming. Especially when you put that in the context of who God is and his might, you realize just like how much he's in control. I don't know if you recognize this picture. Um, anybody know what this picture is? It looks a little bit like the moon, but it's not. This is actually a picture of the planet, um, and I'm not sure which side, is Pluto a planet or not, but this is Pluto. Uh, this picture was actually taken from the New Horizons spacecraft in 2015. It was a special mission from NASA to get to Pluto just to study it so we could learn more about it. So this New Horizons spacecraft was specifically designed to get here to take pictures like this. Here's, here's the thing about it though. <laughs> that just kind of blows my mind when I think about the grandness of space and how big it is. How long do you think it took for that spacecraft, New Horizons, to get from Earth to Mars, or not Mars, to Pluto. Nine and a half years. New Horizons actually launched from Earth in 2006. It wasn't until nine and a half years later, July 2015, that it arrived at Pluto to take this picture. In order to get there in nine and a half years, it had to travel at 50,000 miles per hour. That's a big number. And that's really, really fast. Just to give you a perspective of how fast 50,000 miles an hour is, is if you were to fly from Cleveland to London, normally a seven and a half hour flight, at 50,000 miles an hour, you could get from Cleveland to London in four minutes. That's how fast 50,000 miles an hour actually is. Here, here's another thing about just the, the grandness of space. On that average speed of 50,000 miles an hour, how far do you think it took to get to Jupiter? One year and one month. It took another eight, almost eight and a half years to get from Jupiter to Pluto. Let me put it even on a little bit bigger perspective. When I look up at the stars, I'm not great with constellations and knowing all that, but one I can always pick out is the Big Dipper. How far do you think we are away from the Big Dipper? Answer to that is over six trillion miles. We're three billion miles away from the planet Pluto. Now, three billion may not sound a lot different from six trillion. Again, big numbers, but that's actually 2,000 times farther. So if New Horizons spacecraft were to continue on at 50,000 miles an hour, traveling all the way to the Big Dipper, do you know how long it would take it to get there? 27 Hundred years. That's 2,700 years to get from Earth to the Big Dipper. Listen to this from Isaiah 40. God says, to whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created all these? Who created all of that? He who brings out the starry host one by one, and this is crazy to me, one by one, he brings them out and calls forth each one of them by name. Our mighty God knows every single star by name. It's amazing. Because of his great power and his mighty strength, not one of them is missing. He not only knows them by name, but he holds them in his hands. The same God who holds all of the universe in his hands, holds our life in his. I don't know about you, but when I start to think about things like that, it's a great reminder for me of just how big God is. All of us are guilty of this. All of us, all of our thoughts of God are far too small. None of us think big enough about God. Take the person in this room who has the greatest thoughts of God, their thoughts are still not great enough. 
He's just bigger. And for me, that provides comfort because when I'm facing something that feels really weighty and really big, the best thing I can do to rest in, his, his, in him is just to rest in the fact that I know he's bigger and he's capable and he's more than able to fix and to redeem whatever it is that I'm facing. Now, when I remember how big he is, it also reminds me of this. It also reminds me of how small I am. It reminds me of how small I am. When I was in kindergarten, my, my teacher, Miss Wed, I don't remember a lot about my kindergarten class, but I do remember this one very specific incident. One day I was kind of goofing it off in class with one of my friends. We were pushing each other a little bit, all in fun, and I just like slapped him in the back, um, kind of in the midst of, of, of our goofing off. Well, all Miss Wed saw was me slapping my friend in the back instantly. It's like, David Van Dom, in the hall right now. I was so embarrassed. She had called me out in front of all of my friends. Not only that, when we got in the hall, she ripped me, um, what's a nice way to say this? She ripped me a good one. She laid into me hard. I felt so small, so small. And I'm sure you've all had moments like that where you felt really, really small. And, and, and although like we should never make another person feel small, there is something about realizing just how small we are that's very healthy in how we relate to the almighty God. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 22, it says this. It says, he, God, he sits enthroned above the circle of the earth and it's people me and you, we're like grasshoppers. Aren't you glad you came to church? Such great news. Yeah, do you love God's word? We are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them out like a tent to live in. When our lives start to become too big, when we start to become too big, God becomes small. We've got to remember that it's not we who hold God in our hands. It's he who holds us in his hands. We do not demand from him and ask questions of him. He's the one who first questions us and has demands of us. We are in his hands. Yet, although we are small, this is the best news. This is, this is why Jesus came. This is why he's not just mighty God. He's also these other things too is although we're small, we're not unseen. Although we're small, we're not unseen. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 27, it says, why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say, Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? Anybody ever felt like that? Like your ways hidden from the Lord? It says, my cause is disregarded by my God. Why do you complain, Jacob? Why do you say my way is hidden from the Lord? Although we may be small, God does not forget us and we cannot hide from him. I love Psalm 139. Psalm 139 reminds us that although we might be small, God continues to see us. Psalms 139 verses one through four says, you have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down and you are familiar with some of my ways. No, with all of my ways. Before a word is even on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. Here's what Psalms 139 reminds us, is that God not only sees us, but he's with us. We, can, we cannot escape the presence of God. We cannot go where he already not is there. Like we can't escape his presence. And not only can we not, uh, not only can we, not only is he with us, but he actually knows us. And he knows us better than ourselves. Before a word is even on our tongue, he already knows what you're gonna say ahead of time. He knows us and he knows what's best for us. Although we may be small, we are not unseen. That's how we rest in the mighty God. Here's the third way. The third way we rest in the mighty God is we have to remember that our God's 
might, it has no limits. God's might has no limits. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28 through 29, it says says this. He says, "Um, do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary. I love that. He will not grow tired or weary. I don't know if you've ever thought about this when it comes to who our God is, but God never gets tired. He doesn't get sleepy. He never grows weak. Like his strength, it never runs out. Like he, he, he doesn't need to pause after he's been exerting himself in order to catch his breath. And because of that, these things are also true of God. Because God never wearies or tires, because he knows everything, right? God never worries. God's not worried. God has no fear. God's never in a hurry. And if God is not any of those things, do we need to be? Do we need to be in a hurry? If God's not worried, what do we have to worry about? If he's not afraid, what do we have to be afraid about? That's the power of knowing that we have a God. We have a God who never gets tired or weary. In 1 first, in first Peter uh, chapter 5, uh, verses 6 and 7, it says this. It says, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand. Humble yourselves under God's mighty hand. When we remember how mighty our God is, right? That he may lift you up in due time. And because he's mighty, because he's in control, because he can redeem the chaos, he can bring order out of it as we can cast all our anxiety on him because he cares for you. We rest in God's might when we remember that he's bigger, when we remember that, we're, that our lives and the things we're facing are small in comparison to who he is. And although we are small, we're not unseen. And third, we remember that he never gets tired or weary. His might has no limits. I know for many of us, uh, gosh, in fact, for some of you today, you are facing heartbreak. And as we remember how God, our, uh, how big our God is, what I'm not saying, and what I, I hope you don't hear me saying, is that what you are facing is small. It's not. What you're going through, it's a big deal. It's weighty. It's overwhelming. It's hard to believe how you're going to get through it. But why I love this idea and and why I have to remember that we have a God who's all powerful is because no matter how big the stuff that we face, like he's always bigger. And he's working in ways that I may not completely understand or know. And although it's incredibly painful now, it's incredibly confusing right now. I know eventually he's working for, for the good of those who love him and who live according to his purpose. Psalms 4610, it's one of my favorite verses. It reminds us that the best thing we can do when we're facing chaos, the first thing we should do is not try to figure out how to fix it ourselves. It's not the first thing we should do. When we face chaos, the very first thing we should do is just this, be still. Be still and know that he's God. And he's a God who loves you incredibly. He loves you more than you'll ever know or understand. And he's also a God who's capable. 
He's able. He's strong enough. And he's bigger than you or I could ever realize. And because of that, as you face the chaos of this world, may you remember to lean into him, to rest in him. Instead of despairing in the chaos, that you would learn to rest and have rest in his might. Father God, we are grateful that Jesus came to our world. We're grateful not just because Jesus came to to help us get through this life, but ultimately he came to fix what was broken through his death and his resurrection, that we would know life with you. God, that we would know that no matter what we face in this world, that you are a God who is working in us, you're working through us, and that you are with us, God, and you know what we need in ways we don't even know and understand ourselves. Father, I pray that as we face difficult times, we'd be reminded to lift our eyes up, to ponder your heavens, and your might, knowing we can trust you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks for joining us online here today. Before you go, can we pray for you? Head over to newpoint.org slash prayer, submit your prayer request, and we will have a team this week praying for you specifically. Don't forget, Jammy Jam is happening December 17th. This is a great opportunity for your child to invite a friend. If you've not visited one of our campuses in person, this Sunday would be the time to come. 9 and 11 a.m. are our services time. So we would love to meet you, show you around, and answer any questions that you might have. Again, thanks for joining us today. Have a great week. We'll see you again next time.